We have just had in the first reading a passage which we used to hear often in chapter chanted in Latin. It's one of the key verses quoted by St. Augustine in his rule. It is what gave rise to what in the Middle Ages was referred to as the Ita Apostolica, the apostolic life, that of the early church. You will remember that very soon after Pentecost, the form of Christian life took shape in this element of sharing and making sure that none was in need. A whole discipline developed, and we have it coming also in the writings of St. Paul, that only widows of a certain type, authentic widows in need, were to be inscribed in the list. It's evidence that there was a lot of sharing and charity going on. We find it also in the early evidence from, for instance, St. Justin, who has apology, the apologia of what was going on within Christianity to defend itself against calumny from the outsiders. And we have very early on evidence that at the offertory things were coming up and that there was a sharing of resources in the mind of Christians from the earliest times. Now, it led also, as time went on, to an awareness that the totality of Christianity was not just there, but it meant a concrete way of life. And then it led, bit by bit, under the movement of the Holy Ghost, to a form of life which intensified, but that took time. The monastic life as we know it, a to total absence of the material. But already the handling of the material was becoming an issue, so much so that we find very early on in the Acts that the Apostles themselves had to find some way of getting out of this throttling power of the material. Because the discipline of charity was also draining them. It wasn't their business. And so, inspired by the Holy Spirit, they ordained people just for that, the deacons. There were seven, all men. And it was a name on of hands, and it was a genuine order. That's why you can't have women deacons. It's the same order in three tiers. The fullness of it is in the bishop. The bishop then has helpers, and that comes through in the early church. But initially the bishop would be the one celebrating, and then they'd have eventually the presbyters. He had a crown of presbyters. The word presbyter gives us priest, the same word, means an elder. And they would initially be around him, but then, as time went on, the spreading of Christianity meant they had to have celebrations apart from the bishop. But for a long time, there was a link between the bishop's celebration and that by his delegate, the priest. And it's still residually there in the rite of the commixture, when you have a small particle of the consecrated host placed into the chalice. That goes back to the early church. It would seem that it was the eulogia coming from the bishop that every celebration was in some way linked to his celebration. That's a study in itself, but it's an ancient rite. And we have to mention every time the bishop, the local bishop's name, I was asking John, and there's an auxiliary here now, it's Mike, and he has been mentioned as well, you have to be in communion with the local bishop, that's very important, otherwise it's schism. Now, with regard to the specific issue of the quality of Christian life, that too is seen to be central. Why? It's the one thing that the Lord insisted on in the upper room. It was there that he gave the orders, the apostles, including Judas, were given the fullness. They were all bishops. And also he gave the essence of his teaching. Not complex, it was not made of many rubrics and precepts, but it was made of his new commandment. And that was perceived for what it was. And indeed it was practiced. We have evidence from outsiders. See how these Christians love one another. It was noticed. And therefore when it came to chanting a bit of the Holy Rule every morning in chapter, after Holy Mass, we would have this constant reminder of what we're at. It's shorter than other rules, it's only about a fifth size of the rule of St. Benedict, but for that very reason it is more concentrated on certain points, and this is the central one. Indeed, Augustine, he admitted in one of his many writings that he couldn't live without friends. And he would have a whole concept of what it meant. He had it written on his refectory wall, no one has a place at this table who eats his brother. Therefore, charity extends to talking about someone else. Now, going back to my memories, there are some things which make me still warm inside from remembering happy times, because one does miss sometimes community. 
because all one's formation has been with one's brethren. And I was remembering how over the years I had a lot to do with introistic closed nuns and had to give them retreats or whatever it might be in formation. And I was noticing, as other men have noticed, the difference between the female and the male in community. I'll just give you an example, it's the kind of thing that actually you'll remember. You won't remember concepts so much as examples, but apply it to yourself. It could apply equally to anyone in the family, because the same dynamics will work always when you get men and women living together. Well, I remember I was giving a retreat in France one time in a very strict monastery of the old right, um, daughter house of Fongon Borton's um, Gosson, and uh, there they wanted the full works. Eight days, I think three conferences a day, I can't remember exactly, it was very long in a minute, but they wanted the full works, and it meant also that one is completely immersed in the old right for eight or nine days, which means in the morning one goes into the Abbey Church and one is given an altar at the same time as other priests and they're served by another monk. So all around the Abbey Church there's a buzzing going on and it's very dense. Holy Mass all over the church but individually. So there, I noticed that there was this young woman there in the church, she, she always drifted towards our altar, very pious, and afterwards she told me, I, something told me to go towards that altar. So there she was. And then at the end of the whole retreat, this lady asked to meet me. So I went, Oh, okay, well, look, we're looking for a cook. Can you come over to our monastery for the summer? And because I lost her was French speaking, it's a bit French speaking. And okay, I'll come along. And so there she was. And we were discussing in chapter one day, when the conversation went somewhere, I think she was actually present. Well, said one of the brethren, you put a woman in the midst of a male community and she'll sort of survive. You put a, a man in a female community on his own for a while and he'll crack up. <laughs> and she was completely in accordance. And she was telling me the things that she was observing as a Frenchman in the midst of a French community, how she could see, hmm, and this is still before the storm, the temperatures rise, and tell me, oh, off they go, I'll, ex I'll excuse myself and disappear. <laughs> And she comes back, and then it all back to normal, there's nothing going on. on. So, and she knew perfectly well how men are. Over and done with, they move on, they park it. Now, the other side of the equation is this. Some years ago, I was in Italy, and I heard this. It happened that this postman was going up the garden path, up the drive to the enclosed monastery, and uh, nuns. So, I got closer, and he heard things. He got louder, louder, louder. And he eventually turned out that these nuns were having a slight disagreement. And he was getting louder and louder and louder and louder and quite getting, mm -hmm. he was like, what, this is dangerous, they're really aggressive. So he had to get on to the local authorities. He had to the police, I think, the Carabinier, there's, there's something going on in there, sort it out. So they did, they kind of got in there, what's going on? And the police had to sort out these holy nuns, uh, living in a complete enclosure in perfect ecstatic mode of prayer. Next day, 50 million people heard about this slight word of disagreement because it got to the main right Uno news with the whole of Italy watching. I think it's terrible. Women were not going to go to the church. But I think the Italians have been striving, you know how they are too, when they explode. But women, you see. Because they, they go into these modes and then they don't park it. It goes in. So probably that was a result of nothing is going in for a long time and it just blew the fuse. So that's interesting. The women aren't quite the same. They don't handle things the same. But here, it could be that for years and years they're all being exactly what they should be, and officially they're beautiful. I remember just a few weeks ago, I was writing this to a young nun uh, in a monastery of enclosure in another country, and I drew a picture of something like this an aquarium, and these holy fish moving around, each with a, a halo and a big grin with big, big teeth, and going around one next to the other and uh, doing this note. And then uh, there's the balloons of the, what's going on, you see, in their, in their mind, and with the simultaneous translation service. <laughs> you boil your head in mustard, dear. <laughs> in other words, what you see is what always what's in there. Uh, but with regard to our own community, yes, there were these almighty busters, but they were very soon parked. And the proof was this you can always have a good laugh, and that's a great help. It's actually an indirect way of healing all the pain. Remember the gift of the sense of humour if things are getting heated. Have enough balance to see what you're at, how thick I am. 
stand back up and laugh at yourself. Now, this happened, just a concrete example. I was always involved with my next door neighbour, Père Dominique, and uh, Whitman, one of the great chanters uh, with a smattering humour. And uh, one of my old hands was doing, uh, I was sacked to be here, you know, doing the high boss on Sunday, all these chants were sacked to be here, and who's preaching today, who's saying the thing, oh yeah, <laughs> uh, Falungo, uh, blah blah blah, he's huge. So anyway, you know, <laughs> So I prepared to see the chasm was only under the major chasm when I put uh, what was it all together? I think a razor blade or something. And uh, and because in French, if you shave somebody, it means you're boiling into tears. So I put this razor blade. And I think, uh, so on, so on. Five hundred to be shaved in one go. And then and then uh, and then I also an aftershave also to uh, the consequences to wipe up the consequences. <laughs> vengeance, is, <laughs> vengeance is sweet. He was in charge of the of the kitchen, you see. So when I came back to Vespers afterwards uh, in the evening, uh, uh, no, I was uh, all in bit silence, and so then not a word is wanted. Uh, utter, utter silence, all shot in that, you know, uh, before my place in the refectory. Huge, a huge um, barato um, system of, 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 of uh, Nutella, just one of chocolate Nutella, you see. And, uh, and to boot uh, a long uh, 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 piping, you see, a tube, and a syringe as an intravenous Nutella. And couldn't say a word. <laughs> <laughs> So that's, you see, how it's got over in the community, uh, without any lasting pain. Got the message, lasting pain. So in lasting pain in your home and your heart, get rid of it, because it takes away joy. And if you haven't got joy in the house of God, we're serving the other side. And that can happen too. The devil hates these places, so you're contaminated by the cancer of unforgiveness. And that other thing of going in can be in until death. I remember hearing this on the grapevine. It was a community where somebody left, and the liturgy was very solemn and beautiful. He left eventually for some reason, and this letter came back some time later. It was this, he didn't know the spot where it was. The liturgy was very solemn, very reverent, very beautiful. But I did notice that there were one or two of the brethren who never talked to each other. Now, a young man picks things up. And it's not quite so easy to fool them. Now, this matters with regard to any young people who might be out there, and there are, who want perhaps to examine the question of vocation. So the ingredient of joy is important. There was, some years ago, an article, a full-page article, on one community in the States. It's the Norton House in California, St. Michael. And there, they have a huge number of vocations because they're very faithful. And one young man had answered the question of the interview, why did you enter this community? I was, he said, in a camp, and I noticed one thing. There was joy amongst these brethren, and I wanted it. So they're growing and growing and growing, and now they're the monastery. And with regard to that, I've been telling people recently, until fairly recently, you had sometimes to look outside Ireland for somewhere which is really safe. Now it has actually changed. If you're thinking about a vocation, you can avoid the situation of going into a morgue where the young ones are looking after the elderly ones. And there is, thanks be to God and his divine providence, a community, for instance, where that can happen and you can be guaranteed orthodoxy, reverence and joy in the Lord, which is going to carry you along. Because religious life is not always up there. It's often really down there in the heart of the person who's going to talk to. And that's the bit that can be safeguarded. I'm thinking of, just I've got a message from Hannah Nestle Opera Company, but the one of the fathers here, because they've got fathers and sisters who have just written to me, they were trying to meet up with me yesterday, I didn't get the message in time. The home of the mother, it's where Sister Claire Crockett was, and she died in that earthquake in Latin America. But she, through Providence, died there and had a greater effect after her life than during it. Because gone round and young people look at this on, this is interesting. So and I've been telling girls and they and they get good answers from them. They, they, they don't have a for instance limit of age, which is important, they're open, but they do have this element of authenticity and this balance of having priests of their own to look after them. And that's not indifferent because the complementarity of those poems is a huge benefit. Because girls on their own without the men to look after them and keep things orthodox and give them nourishment on their level, a bit of liturgy, 
is sometimes unhelpful. I mean, part of the problem actually in Ireland, that, for instance, carbon light lands or whatever, small communities, don't have a priest on their level. They have no priest coming in and going out. But they're not lavished in the same way as one of their own would be, with beautiful sun liturgy, heavy, dense teaching, good confessions. It's a big difference. So there is out there this great blessing that we have now in Ireland, beware that one can orientate a girl, or even actually a boy, to that new adventure which is actually being blessed literally by the Lord. Why? He's in command. And that's what we want. And those who are only superficial, but have a superficial effect. Those also who are led and, as it were, formed by priests who are with it, giving all the latest doctrines, won't necessarily be blessed. And contamination can come in to what they hear in church. Whereas if they're defended and guided by priests of their own, who only give the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, it'll be a different equation. And the Lord knows it full well. So any of you who are interested or know about young people who might be interested, be aware, no more than they have to go outside Ireland. There are new foundations, because the bishops out there are looking for them and digging them in. I conclude. All that goes back to the reading that we have from the Acts of the Apostles. It applies also to us. One heart and one mind. We had, very close to us in Italy, a female monastery following the same rule. It was the Augustinian nuns of Liceto. And they were bursting at the seams with young vocations. They were talking about making a new foundation when I was there. And they also had very beautiful liturgy and joy. And I saw one very, example, very good example of this when I was with them one time in their house in Rome, house of formation in Rome. Their abbot, abbess, was with them, and there were two young nuns there, and I was looking at what they were doing amongst themselves and talking to me. There were one of the other, I think there were two twins actually, nuns, and I noticed that one of them just spontaneously put her arm around another abbess who was young and said, what a good mother she is to us. And that is an interesting indication. Spontaneously, they were able to be happy to be together. That's what we want in the house of the Lord. Because if it's not there, the heart is not free to love either him or those in his house either.